Hey guys, you're listening to the We Could Make That podcast, and I'm your host, Andrea Ween. On this show, I interview small batch, independent food makers who've struck out on a noble cause, making the world as tasty as possible. In each episode, I'm digging into their backgrounds, motivations, and passions to decode why and how they started their businesses and the lessons we can each take back to our own kitchens and lives. Let's get started. Hey guys, before we jump into today's show, I'd love if you took a second to subscribe. That way, you'll never miss an episode. And there are some really good ones coming down the line. You can also check out the show notes and resources mentioned during this episode at wecouldmakethat.com slash cocktail. Okay, now to my guest for today, Alex Abbott Boyd. Alex is the founder of Cocktail Crate, a craft cocktail mixer using fresh, high-quality ingredients. For example, where all other cocktail mixers use concentrate, Alex and his team source fresh juice from a family farm in Florida. Not as easy as it sounds. During this show, we talk about traveling far and wide for the best flavors in food, how Cocktail Crate got its start on the back of a Kickstarter campaign, and of course, because it's me, the first time Alex got drunk. He also dishes up some advice for aspiring food entrepreneurs and gives his tips for what to order at the bar when the cocktails might be questionable. Cheers. Alex, good morning. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Oh, it's a pleasure. So I want to get to what you do with Cocktail Crate, but I want to step back and talk about how you grew up and, and your childhood a bit and maybe get some insight into how you became a food entrepreneur. So give me a little background on on where you grew up and your family life. Uh, sure. Well, uh, we definitely moved around a bit. Um, my mom is Australian and my dad is a New Yorker uh, and they met in India. Um, and so they're, they're both kind of hippies. And so, you know, at first we we lived in the U.S. for a little bit, and then we lived in Australia for about seven years, um, and then we moved back to the U.S. when I was around eleven. And and just because they were they were super hippies, like I mean, when we lived in the U.S., we lived in Maine. They moved out into like the the woods in Maine, and and like had orchards and grew vegetables, and um, did pickling and making everything from scratch and. And they were both very much into food. And so I was definitely constantly growing up with, with really good homemade food. And, you know, when we were in Australia, we had a garden. And when I was little, one of my favorite things was always running out into the yard to pick parsley to garnish our pasta with and things like that. And, and pretty, pretty early on, as soon as I, I, I would burn the house down, they would always be like, all right, well, now you're going to cook dinner. So where they, they taught me how to cook some some of the dinners that we enjoyed in and then had me and my sisters helping out in the kitchen. And so I'd always just really loved good food and entertaining and, and yeah, just good, good food and, and spending time with family and friends around it. Yeah. You know, I just moved back from Australia, so I've been living there for the past two years. Which part of the country did you live in? Uh, we were in Melbourne. And okay. then my mom is from uh, a tiny little town in Victoria called Kangaroo Flat or in Bendigo and part of Bendigo called Kangaroo Flat, which is about the most Australian name ever. <laughs> yeah, we took a we were in Sydney, but we took a trip to Kangaroo Island, which there were plenty of kangaroos there, so it was not disappointing. <laughs> Lived up to its moniker. How many That's sisters awesome. do you have? Uh two. Two. And are you where do you fall in the rank? Uh I, I'm the oldest. You're the oldest. Okay. Great. And do they are they in the food business as well or have they gone on to do other things? Uh, no, they're they're doing other things, finance and counseling. Okay. So it seems like you really had this basis for good flavors and, and what good food was from a pretty young age, which I'm sure helped to develop the flavor profiles and everything later in life. And I read that, you know, you always had beverage as a passion. So whether it was beer in college or tea when you got a little bit older and, and went to India, I... Can you tell me the story? I, I read somewhere that you took a very long bike ride just to go to a certain brewery. Is that true? Oh, yeah. That was um, that was right before my senior year of college. Uh, we're go- I was going to school in Chicago, and a friend of mine just decided that we'd spend the week before school started just biking around the Midwest. Uh, and so it was quite an adventure. Kind of the farthest point and, and ultimate goal uh, was Bell's Brewery uh, up in Michigan, 
Um, and we kind of had a lot of fun getting there. We, we biked the first day 90 miles to Notre Dame and were asleep on the floor while there was a Notre Dame frat party going on. And then we spent a few days with the Amish people in northern Indiana and then, and then biked up to Michigan and had some great beer and biked back to Chicago along Lake Michigan. It was, it was a really fun trip. Uh, and what was, what one of the funny surprising things to me was when we got to the brew pub in Kalamazoo, Michigan, we were by far not the only people to have biked there. There was just like rows and rows of people. I mean, I'm sure many of them were locals, but it just seemed like biking to this, this bar and then drinking a ton of beer was a pretty common thing there, which was a lot of fun. I was going to ask if the brewery was very impressed that you guys had biked so far, but I guess maybe it was not so uncommon. <laughs> yeah, it seems, it seems like we were not the first people to have that idea. And you said you hung out with the Amish for a few days. Like you actually stopped and hung out with families. Like what do you mean by that? Well, we met an Amish family on the internet, which I know sounds counterintuitive, but they're, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they, they use, I mean, some, some use the internet for work. And so they, they had a business where they would like have travelers in and kind of cook them a Thanksgiving style meal. And so we connected with one family there and signed up for their meal. And then we're just like, Oh, by the way, do you mind if we camp on your, your land? And I remember the guy looked at when we were setting up, he was extremely skeptical of our tent. He set up bales of hay in his barn for us because he thought that was a far more reasonable place to sleep. But in the end, he was just very happy to let us stay on his land, which we really appreciated. Okay. So then that sense of travel and going far for good tastes uh, continued because you ended up in India, right? Searching for tea? I did. I did. I mean, so going back to, to the Australia connection, you know, my mom grew up drinking tea and so she made, I mean, that meant that we grew up drinking tea and, and most of the time it was just like a nice strong black tea with milk and having it several times a day and, and just loving that. But a, a little bit after college, I started getting much more into it and about learning about all the different varieties. And I was so excited that n now that I had a job, I could afford to actually go to India. And so I, I decided to visit this organic tea estate in Darjeeling called Makai Bari. Which was, it was the first one and it's, it's pretty famous. You know, I know it supplies honest tea with, with their organic Darjeeling tea as well. Um, which I, did, I didn't know at the time. So I did, I did a homestay there for several days and I just spent a lot of time, um, wandering around the tea garden, learning about, about organic farming, learning about the processing. I was really lucky to spend a little bit of time getting to know the owner, which was really cool. And just really seeing like firsthand the difference between what organic and, and they were even a little bit more um, sustainable in the sense that they were biodynamic. So they really tried to make like huge parts of their estate, just like almost wild rainforest to really cultivate biodiversity. Just seeing the difference between that estate and then the ones next door, which were just like these, these monocrops where everything was either if it wasn't a tea plant, it was just like dead soil. Um, and so that, that was really eye opening as well as just seeing, you know, the different ways you process it and how those end up in the different flavors that you get from different kind of teas that the, that the place was making. And is that open to the public or did you have to kind of seek that out and find a way to get yourself in there? They, they actually have a homestay program. Um, I mean, it's, it's not very formal, but they, they, they connected me with, you know, a local family who I stayed with for, for the time that I was there. Uh, and then I kind of just, you know, had to wander over and, and, and go on the different tours and the experiences they had, but it was, it was definitely open. You know, it's, it's just also a little hard, hard to get to. It involves like a several hour terrifying Jeep ride up the mountains and things like that. Welcome to India. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's take a step back now and come to, you come back from India, actually, and you're working in consulting, right? Yep. And you're thinking, this just isn't cutting it for me. Now you've had these travel experiences, perhaps, that have kind of even more broadened your horizons and given you inspiration. What happens next? Uh, well, so I was assigned on a, both a really fun and a really horrible uh, project for work. I was sent to Cairo, Egypt. And it was it was at a time it was like the Arab Spring had happened the year before. So so I was working for Pepsi, Egypt. And like, you know, obviously, they had a really bad year, the year of the revolution. And they were they were trying to get things going back on track again. But like, 
the military coup that was going to happen the next year was kind of like starting to ferment. And so it was like, it was an interesting time to go there. Um, so I love the travel aspect. And I had a few friends from college who, who lived in Cairo and were Egyptian and getting to spend a little bit of time with them and, and learn about the political situation was super fun. But what, what was horrible was I had almost no time for that because I was working 16 hour days trying to make this, these like Doritos factories work better. Um, and then on top of that, uh, they also sent us during Ramadan and no one in Egypt does any work during Ramadan because they're tired and hungry. Um, so they come into the office for like two hours and then don't answer any emails and then go home. And so, so there were this really intense project, uh, that was almost impossible to do because, because of the time of year. And even if we had succeeded would like help sell marginally more Doritos, which I just really didn't care for, didn't see the point in making that a bigger thing. I mean, essentially we were like tapping people on the shoulder who were like fighting for democratic freedom and asking them what kind of packaging they wanted on their potato chips. And, and just the idea was just so ridiculous that it was like, it was sufficiently ridiculous that it was the kick in the butt I needed. And, and so just in, in the middle of that project, I'm like this, I can't take this anymore. Um, I have to find something I can actually be passionate about and get behind. And, and so I just quit in the middle of that and, and then came back to New York. You quit while you were in Egypt. Yes. I mean, in the, in the middle of the project, actually. Uh, how did that go over? Did you have to pay for your own flight back then? No, no. I mean, they, I mean, they paid for my flight. I mean, they, they definitely weren't going to strand me in Egypt or anything. I mean, I, I actually worked two more weeks to help transition my replacement in working 16 hour days. And I felt like after I'd quit putting in that much, that much more work really was, was, you know, I didn't want to leave anyone in a tough situation. I just realized it was a place that I, I didn't want to be either. Okay. That makes sense. Wow. That takes a lot of courage. Congratulations for taking a huge step like that. Well, thank you. It was, uh, we can blame Steve Jobs. Uh, he has this commencement speech to Stanford where he talks a lot about taking big steps and trusting that the dots will connect in, uh, when you look back. And so I, I actually watched that speech like three times before going over to my manager and quitting. All right. Well, we'll link to it in the show notes just in case anyone listening is in need of some inspiration from good old Steve. So did you have the inklings for the idea for Cocktail Crate then before you quit? Or was it just, I need to get out of the situation and I'll figure it out when I get back? It was, it was a little bit of both. Um, so for most of the time that I was a consultant, I was just like brainstorming different ideas uh, for potential businesses, some in tea, some in liquor. And then, and then one of the, the, the big problems I had noticed is like, I, I loved entertaining and food. Like I, like I kind of, you know, alluded to earlier. And, and I, as soon as I was into cocktails, I was always having my friends over and I was always spending like basically a few, a few horrible dinner parties for me, although they were great for my guests were spent where I would just be making individual cocktails for people all night rather than hanging out and, and enjoying myself. Um, and so I kind of noticed this issue where it's like, all right, if you do like cocktails and you do want to try to serve them, even if you know how to make them, it's still like, it's like so time consuming. Why aren't there any good mixers out there? Um, and so, so that was one of the ideas that was floating around in my mind. And, and, and I think what was really helpful was, um, having gone all in before having actually selected my idea, which is generally a pretty stupid thing to do. The, one of the benefits of it was it forced me to figure it out really quickly. And so I think I quit in September and within about a month, like by the end of November of that year, I had a Kickstarter campaign launched and, and the Kickstarter was kind of my way of just testing out this idea. Cause I thought, okay, cocktails, I love them and, and people in New York and, and elsewhere are starting to really love them. And I can see that because like even the local Italian restaurant in my grandma's neighborhood uh, way out in Queens has fresh juices and a cocktail program. So like it seems like it's becoming more mainstream to like cocktails. I'm sure I'm not the only one who likes them at home. Let's just test out the idea. And so I hadn't like figured out what packaging would look like. I, had, I hadn't even finalized the production space or even all the flavors. But with Kickstarter, I was able to put the idea out there and just see if it resonated with anyone. And what was cool was it did. You know, it was it was in a small way. It was uh, five thousand dollars that that I raised through Kickstarter. But just just seeing that strangers were willing to give me money for this 
when it was still mostly just an idea that was kind of the in like that that was like the aha moments like okay maybe this idea really does have legs and then just you know in the process of fulfilling my kickstarter uh promises to give people these mixers i i had to build up the company i had to find a production space finalize flavors get my packaging ready and then and then after i sent out those those kickstarter kickstarter rewards i was like oh I have some leftover mixers. Let let's take them to the local grocery store and and see what happens. And and it just kind of grew from there. So for people who don't know, the Kickstarter is a crowdfunding campaign, basically that people can pay money to be able to get an idea off the ground. So I like it's such a smart way to test proof of concept, which is what it sounded like you did, and it worked out really well. How did you think about those first few flavors? What was the thought process and kind of the ideation around which ones you launched with? Yeah, so there's, it was actually, we've learned a lot about flavors. Two of the three flavors that we launched with, we still sell. And one of them, we, we definitely don't. For me, it was, it was very personal. It was just like the, the things that I really liked. So I love ginger and I, Moscow mules and dark and stormies were at the time one of my favorite drinks. Um, and, and so I started out making a ginger one and, and I also really love honey. So I, I came up with our ginger bee, which is a mix of, of fresh ginger juice and honey. I really loved old fashions. And so I made this old fashioned mix. And then going back to the tea, uh, there's a smoky Chinese black tea called Lapsang Sushong, uh, that I loved, although it's like pretty esoteric and out there. And so I put that into a mixer that I called smoky hops. And, and I think it's funny to see like the degree to which I had no idea what I was doing when I started our old fashioned mix. I mean, it's brown sugar and it's got cinnamon and allspice and, and, and orange. And it's, it's a very warming kind of, it's especially good during the fall and the holidays. So I called it holiday old fashioned. Uh, and I launched it in February, which is ridiculous because no, no store is buying anything holiday related <laughs> February. And, and so that was, it took me a full year before I just changed the name to Spiced Old Fashioned. And then all of a sudden I could sell it at all times of the year. But I always love looking back on that to just, to just remind myself how stupid I was right at the beginning. Cause since then I released a couple other flavors. I, I released a lavender one. I released a spicy margarita, a maple whiskey sour, a grapefruit daiquiri. And, uh, we just came out with a michelada mix, which is for making a beer cocktail. And, and there was a ton of, a, a ton of kind of give and take with customers to figure out what to do. And, and what we ended up settling on, and, and you can kind of tell it from the, 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 the most recent flavors is doing twists on classics. Like we, I found early on when I put a smoky hops or a lavender bloom mixer in front of people, they had no idea what that was, what to do with it. And they definitely weren't going to like risk, like at the time when we started, our mixers were $16 each. They were not going to risk $16 on this thing that, that they had never heard of. Like, but at the same time, we saw like the old fashions doing really well and the gingers doing well because people have had those in drinks. They have had those drinks. They kind of know what they're going to need to do with them. They were a little bit exciting, a little bit new. You know, something that they hadn't had before, but they, they were twists on what they had, you know, experienced and loved. And so that's why, like, once I saw, like, how tough it was selling smoky hops, despite how delicious it was, and, and the same with lavender, that's why we went with the maple whiskey sour and the grapefruit daiquiri. Just people know whiskey sours, people know daiquiris. Um, and so we're going to do this really fun, unique twist on it, but we're going to keep it within the realm of, like, you know, what you, what you can use. Well, and I would imagine now that you have some brand trust and people have had maybe some of the ones that are a little bit um, safer, that people might trust you to try out some new flavors as you come out with them. Yeah, I'm I'm still dreaming of bringing back Smoky Hops. I'll definitely call it something more more accessible, but it, the the flavor of it with the smoked uh, tea and some, a little bit of honey in there, oh, it was so good. I'm I'm hoping to figure out how to bring that one back. Yeah, whenever I drink that tea, I always think it is campfire. So maybe something yeah. around, you know, campfire esque, yeah, smokiness. That's that's perfect. Uh, I'm thinking maybe I'll, maybe a little lemon juice and then calling it a smoked whiskey sour or something like that. Yeah, I think there's there's a lot of lot of fun ideas there. 
So I can imagine with the company that you get quite a few people who might be cocktail novices who want to experiment and try some things. So what mixers would you recommend they start with? How do you get someone started if they're just kind of starting to dabble in cocktails? For sure. Well, I actually recommend all of our mixers. Um, and when I was designing them and trying to figure out what would make them valuable and, and a big part of that same process where we we figured out what flavors people most uh, connected with, I realized that the biggest problem is how intimidating it can be to make a, a cocktail. And, and I actually think that's intentional. Like I know a huge amount about cocktails. Uh, I've read 20 books. I can make many delicious cocktails. Um, I have like 40 bottles of liquor at home. And most of the time when I go out to a cocktail bar or even a restaurant that has a cocktail menu, I don't know what half the ingredients are. And so I just think the way they're often presented is is almost intentionally intimidating and making it seem like it's this complex science when it isn't. So I knew one of the priorities that I wanted to have with the mixers is, is to make an effortless craft cocktail for people. So pretty much all of our flavors are you add a shot of liquor, a shot of mixer, and you shake it with ice you know, across the board. And, and with a lot of them, it's like whatever liquor you happen to like most is probably going to go well with it. Like, um, you know, our, our whiskey sour is great with whiskey. It's also great with other aged spirits like uh, brandies or aged rums, but you can do it with vodka and it's also going to be good. Um, and, and the recipe is pretty much the same. The, the only difference on the recipes are old fashioned because you want that to be such a strong and stiff drink. It's just mostly whiskey with a little bit of mixer. Um, but for the rest, they're all equally easy to use. And that was very intentionally designed on, on my part. So you source ingredients from a lot of other small independent producers, um, everything from the tea, which is, uh, is the tea that you went and visited in India, that producer, uh, to the ginger and kind of all the ingredients that go into what you guys make. Why is that important to you? The number one most important thing for me and it goes hand in hand with making an effortless craft cocktail. Like the ratio that you mix it with is what makes it effortless. And what, what makes it craft is the taste. And so the taste has to be amazing. And I mean, it's no secret, like the way you get amazing flavors is you use amazing ingredients. Um, and so it was just, it very much flowed naturally out of, out of wanting to create the best taste. I mean, I think one, one of the, the values of starting the way I did where I, I knew nothing about the like the packaged food industry was what seemed to make sense to me was I'll just take the cocktail recipes as I make them at home when I'm making two drinks and I will figure out how to scale that into you know a, a larger uh, slightly more industrial process where I can make a hundred a thousand bottles at a time which is really different so like if anyone had been in the food industry at all you approach it from a totally different perspective. And, and I think the most obvious example to kind of illustrate this point is juice. So for me, it was just obvious. So when you make a drink, you use fresh squeezed lemon or lime juice. That's just like one of the most important things. If I had had any work in the food industry, I would have gone with juice concentrate, which is pretty gross. It's like this green or yellow goop that you then, that you then add water back to, to get something that's supposed to taste like lemon or lime juice. And it's what every other cocktail mixer out there uses. And it's, in fact, what all the really, quote unquote, good cocktail mixer uses, because other ones just, I mean, use something even even shittier. And so for me, it was like, OK, how do I figure out how to translate that into a production process? And so and so it just started with trying to find who who could supply me with those ingredients. And because of the nature of like industrial manufacturing, there isn't a huge supply chain for like, there's not, there's not a giant company that can sell me uh, fresh squeezed lemon juice or fresh squeezed lime juice. It's going to be, you know, a smaller operation, um, you know, where we get our, our lemon and lime and orange and grapefruit juices is a company called Natalie's in Florida, which is this family owned company. And they just make this amazing juice and they, they own some of the groves down in Florida and, and, it's just great working with them because the product is amazing and because they kind of share the same values and they're in business for the same reasons that we are. As you guys continue to grow, how do you maintain that sense of quality? Uh, well, l luckily, we have a huge amount of runway left. You know, I've, from the days when I was making deliveries to a couple of grocery stores in New York to now, we've, we've grown a lot, but compared to even a 
you know, a small or medium sized uh, food company, we still have a lot of leeway to grow. Um, I mean, I think it's just going to be growing with all of the suppliers because it's a very organic and natural growth. We can kind of just grow together. I mean, that, that's how it's been working bef- so far. And, and it seems like that's, that's going to be the case for, for a while to come. Okay. Great. Do you have any advice for anyone who might be interested in starting a beverage company? Um, probably don't start the way I did where I quit before I had any sort of product or plan. Why not? Uh, it worked out for you. <laughs> <laughs> it did, but I, I would definitely much rather have kind of worked out the packaging, some of the supplying, the production, all that kind of stuff before I think I think would have been a, a really smart way to go. But I think it's really important to just be very clear. And this goes back to the planning before you jump in. But it's I think it's really important to be clear on what you want out of your business before you start it. So in my mind, I kind of imagined when I was starting this like artisanal Brooklyn story of spending all day handcrafting these mixers and selling them. And since I love cocktails, I thought this would be great. And and very quickly, I realized some things like, oh, a huge part of my time is going to be being a salesperson. And, oh, it turns out I don't actually like doing the same thing a thousand times in the same way. Luckily for me, it turns out I've really loved and been excited by the process of, of building a larger company and and finding suppliers and finding distributors and flying across the country and pitching retailers like Target. And that's turned out to be something that I really love, but I had no idea that's what I was getting into. And And I've seen a lot of other food producers who they just really love baking, say, and they built a baking company and now they're frustrated that they're spending all of their time like scheduling the other bakers and ordering ingredients rather than making cookies. And so I think it, it really helps to be clear on what you want and what the business might actually look like because so many people, including myself, had really no idea what they were getting into. Um, and I got lucky because I, I, I loved it, but other people don't get so lucky. Yeah, I think that might be one of the biggest myths of entrepreneurship that you're if you are a baker that you're going to get into it and then suddenly you're right, you're just doing sales and marketing and all these other things that have nothing to do with being in the kitchen. Exactly. What does your day-to-day look like now? You kind of gave a a brief insight into it, but can you give me a little bit more detail on what you do on a day-to-day? It's kind of all over the place. I I no longer um, you know, make each mixer for for 2 years I was I pretty much handmade every single bottle and hand delivered. And then, and now I've got a great team that's working on the manufacturing. I, I work with a whole handful of distributors around the country. So a big part of the time is just spent making sure everything is going smoothly in those things. Like product is getting made. It's really tasty. All the ingredients needed for production runs are there. Orders are getting shipped out and invoiced and, and that kind of stuff. And then another big part of it is, is figuring out like what, what are our priorities? What are we working on? Like, you know, we're going into the holidays now. And so I'm, I'm spending a lot of time figuring out the last few days. All right. What are all the things we're going to do to support the mixers during the holidays? You know, we have to call up our stores. We have to come up with posters. We have to create blog posts. We have to, to put together this whole system that's going to kind of really support and get people as excited about the mixers as we are. And so it's kind of split between those more bigger picture, fun strategy, like what, what should we be working on and pushing for the next few months? And then that day to day, just making sure orders are getting shipped out. And as with everything, it's, it's very easy for that day to day to kind of take over. But I think I've got a pretty good system for just forcing at least a few hours every day to be kind of pushing the ball forward as well. What's next for you guys? Well, we uh, are really excited because we're doing two, they're called like tests in stores uh, for the holidays. One is in about 250 Target stores, which I'm incredibly excited about. They're, you know, going to be one of our biggest retailers. They, in many of the Target stores, they're going to be selling liquor in the same aisle, which is very exciting because, you know, when in, in Whole Foods, when you buy our mixers, like you have to go to a different store for the liquor. So having it all with the liquor and, and, in, and in such a uh, a, a large and sophisticated retailer like Target is very exciting. We're also working on 
a really cool uh, product for Sam's Club, um, which is going to be testing us in 10 of their clubs down in the Southwest. And we've kind of built this really beautiful palette display because there, you know, in, in the club channel, they don't have shelves. They just, you drop a pallet of product on the floor. And so we've been designing this really beautiful pallet display with, with like posters on it and recipe ideas. And, and I'm just really excited to see that get, get made and get into the stores and just to see how people respond to that. That's great. Congratulations. I'm excited to tell some friends and family across the country to check it out at their local stores. Oh, well, thank you so much. So I did a little bit of digging on you. I'm going to put you on the spot. So your LinkedIn profile says that one of your interests is corny jokes. <laughs> so I have to ask if you have a good one to share. A good corny joke. Hmm. Do you know why anteaters don't get sick often? No. They're full of antibodies. Oh, that's good. I call those dad jokes. Hashtag dad joke. <laughs> yeah. All right. Just to round out here, I do a series of quick fire questions if you're up for those. Uh, sure. What is the most memorable cocktail you've had in the past year that can't be cocktail crate? The most memorable cocktail in the past year. I was recently in Mexico uh, just for a vacation and I picked up this bottle of mezcal that was made uh, just a, basically in the backyard of this guy. And he'd also infused it with this wild like mountain herb that no one I was with seemed to be aware of a name for in English. Uh, it had this, so it had this great smokiness. It had some nice flavor just from the artisanal mezcal. So it had some good agave flavor, some smokiness from the processing. And then this really strong herb flavor. And I went back with the, the tour guide who had taken us on the tour and we started mixing it up. And I, I mixed a little of that into basically a gimlet. I mean, it was with gin and lemon juice and simple syrup. And that was just an incredible, incredibly complex and delicious and smoky and wonderful drink. Mm, mezcal is my favorite liquor, so I can relate to that one. It's a good one. Oh, well, awesome. I brought about uh, 10 bottles of artisanal mezcal back from Mexico. So, Well, maybe we'll have to get together and do a drinking session. <laughs> so your first drinking experience, the first time you got drunk, I want to hear that story. The first time I got drunk. No one's ever asked me that in a podcast. Uh, <laughs> good. We like that on the show. Well, see, I was I was a very responsible uh, and nerdy high schooler, so it wasn't actually until after I finished high school that summer. I was working as a tour guide at the the Natural History Museum in New York City, uh, and with a whole bunch of the other tour guides, we we just kind of went to. We'd always walk back across Central Park. One of them lived on Fifth Avenue, right on the other side of the park, and we'd always hang out in her apartment, and then. We had a we had a big natural history themed party, and I was introduced to the game Kings, and it was a lot of fun. And we talked about dinosaurs and extinct mammals, so uh, <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't get much cooler than that. Yeah, it sounds like a great night out. Okay, so you, say you're at a bar and you know it's not going to be good cocktails. What is your go-to drink? I know it's not going to be good cocktails. Yeah, you're just kind of at a dive bar. Uh, well, I, I really love craft beer. So if, if I have grave doubts about the, the cocktail program, I mean, there's some safe ones that are impossible to mess up, like a Campari and soda. Um, so I, if I, if I'm definitely feeling more, more like a cocktail, I might go with something like that, but, but otherwise I'll just go with a craft beer. What's your favorite? What's my favorite? I, I mean, I love stouts and porters and dark beers, um, so I'll usually I'll usually look for one of them. But I mean, the classic, you know, the classic craft beers like your your Brooklyn Brewery and Lagunitas. I mean, I, I, I kind of love those, too. OK, very cool. Just a couple more here. Do you have a most loved kitchen tool that you like to use when you cook? A most loved kitchen tool. Well, we recently got a really awesome Martha Stewart Dutch oven, which has made making soups and stews and sauces just so much more fun. Yeah, I might have to say the, the Dutch oven. It's It's been kind of game changing. I can't wait. I'm going to try to make a sourdough bread in it this weekend, too. Ooh, that sounds good. Let me know how that goes. Yeah. 
And then the last question here, you mentioned briefly that you've read quite a few mixology books, but do you have one that you would recommend, your favorite mixology cookbook, if you will? I think a fun one that was was where I started is a super classic called uh, The Joy of Mixology um, by this bartender, Gary Regan, who was, who was one of the first, uh, I guess, good bartenders back then there. He didn't have the word mixologist back then, so he called himself a cocktailian. But that is that is a really good classic. I mean, I think if if you're just starting out, something like like that is probably the way to go because he spends a lot of time trying to teach you a little bit about how drinks work and 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 the history behind them and and how to make different ones. And I mean, there's there's been a lot of really trendy and fancy books coming out put out by mixology bars. PDT was the first one. There's a Death & Co. one, an Employees Only one, one called Liquid Intelligence by this guy, Dave Arnold, whose bar is Booker & Dax in the city. But all of these bars, like you kind of need to have a bar for them to be any use for you. Or you, you, you know, they have, you were, to make all the drinks in them, you need about 250 different bottles of something. And so I've, I've read those, but they're not really that useful to me unless, unless I want to look at like one very specific drink. So I think, I think Gary Regan's is a good way to start. Uh, there's another one by, um, Dale DeGroff called The Craft of the Cocktail, um, which is definitely a lot more accessible just in terms of the ingredients and the recipes and, and is, is another great place to go. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Alex. This has been great. Can you tell people how to find you and how to buy some cocktail crate? For sure. So um, you can definitely learn a lot about us on cocktailcrate.com. Um, you can follow us on Instagram, uh, which is at cocktailcrate. And uh, depending where you are in the country, you can get our mixers at Whole Foods Market. You can get them at World Market. You can get them uh, now at Target. Um, and, and a lot of other stores around the country. So on our, on our website, cocktailcrate.com, we have a locator, um, and we'll also ship you a bottle if you want to try. Perfect. Well, thanks so much for the time. Have a great day, and we'll talk soon. Thanks so much. It was a pleasure. Yo, hope you enjoyed the show. To check out the show notes and resources, don't forget, it's wecouldmakethat.com slash cocktail. Oh, yeah, and subscribe. See you next time. Yeah.